Merhaba. All right. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, that's the first opportunity I have to uh, to visit uh, uh, Istanbul. So, and weather is bearable for me coming from the north. So, 30 degrees is just perfect, fine. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about today is to introduce an important application area for machine learning, uh, drug discovery. Now, it's a broad field, so we'll focus on one very specific uh, uh, task, which is um, drug target activity prediction. I'll introduce that uh, uh, briefly. And we will tackle that mostly using methods called uh, matrix factorization, more specifically Bayesian matrix factorization uh, with side uh, information. Uh, so I'll start with the context, and then I'll, I'll dive into the methods that we have been uh, uh, developing. Yeah. So I work in drug discovery uh, together with pharmaceutical partners. And the pharmaceutical industry has been uh, struggling in the past uh, uh, decades because the, uh, the number of drugs that they've been able to bring to the market has been going down steadily. Okay? It's not a complete consensus of why it is the case. Uh, to some extent, probably the easiest biology has already been done, and also probably the, the bar that uh, agencies that authorize medications on the market, um, the bar is getting higher and higher because people want safer and safer medicines. Medicines that we're used to use, like aspirin, would probably never be approved today. Okay, so there are big issues there, but that's the result, that's the pressure the industry is, is facing. Now, um, developing a, a, a drug is a very long process. It takes over a decade, and you don't start from an idea and then develop a product. No, you actually have this funnel. You start many, many, many projects, and then they progress to uh, different uh, phases. So basically, at the beginning, you will look at hundreds of thousands of molecules, and then you'll maybe start l focusing on different projects, maybe in total 10,000 different molecules that you think might be active in this or that uh, uh, disease. That's the drug discovery stage. Then you're going to start working in, in the lab, trying to check, you know, is this molecule doing the kind of things that you believe it is uh, uh, doing, then doing studies in, in animals, and then you can enter what we call the clinical trials. So in the first phase, it's just to, to check that uh, the molecule is not dangerous. So you'll just take a few tens of uh, healthy volunteers, give them escalating doses of the molecule, and see if nothing bad happens. If the molecule passes those tests, uh, then it can move to phase two, which will involve typically hundreds of patients where we're going to try to figure out what kind of dose uh, would be uh, uh, reasonable to give to actual patients. And then when you feel that you know what you're doing, then you progress to the full trial to phase uh, uh, three, where there you might have to look at thousands of patients and compare the drug versus the standard of care or the drug versus a placebo if there is no standard treatment uh, uh, available. And if the dr drug proves effective and safe, then you can uh, um, uh, asked to have it approved to go on the market, you present it to the regulatory authorities, and uh, then if you get approval, the drug goes on the market. Um, now we're actually even going further. Once the drug is on the market, we still follow it up, and if we discover that, um, for example, bad side effects do occur, it might get removed from, from the market. Okay? So to get one molecule in the market, we might start by looking at 10,000 initial molecules over maybe 100 different projects. And projects will, will move one phase, or one step, two steps, three steps forward, and then they will fail. So when we say that it costs a fortune, and we don't know the actual numbers because nobody wants to disclose the right numbers, nobody wants to agree on the methodology, but numbers between one and five billion dollars to uh, uh, bring a drug on the market is what you, you will mostly see. 
Here they talk about 2.6 billion. It's not the cost of actually all the work that is done on that particular molecule. It's the cost over all the different projects that were pursued and then eventually failed uh, and then divided by the molecules you bring on the market. So pharma companies fail what we call the, the curse of attrition. That, yes, you can uh, go to the first step, uh, for example, in preclinical, and then you go to phase one, and then in this study, a study for 2014, uh, just uh, over two-thirds of the drugs move from phase one to phase two. From phase two to phase three, only a third uh, uh, was able to go to phase two, and from phase three to regulatory uh, uh, approval, only 60% was able to get through. And then from actually uh, uh, presenting your molecule for approval and actually getting the approval, so even though you've gone through the hoops of the first three phase, we still only have 80 or so percent of being uh, approved on the market for a multitude of uh, uh, reasons. And of course, you know, when you fail, well, you lose all the money you spent. And the later you fail, that's also important, the more you lose. So if you fail in phase three, that's much worse than failing in phase one. But of course, if you fail a thousand uh, projects in phase one, that's still extremely expensive. To, to give an idea, a full phase three can cost several hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and actually, we, we don't know that much about molecules. So when, when we test them, even when we go to clinical trials, we're still very often surprised. So this is actually the main reasons for failures for uh, submissions between, uh, um, uh, so in 2011 and 2012, from phase two onwards. And even when you arrive in phase two, you, can, you see that there's lots of failure because the molecule is just not effective. So in the lab, you designed a molecule and you thought it was doing something, and it's definitely doing what you think it's doing, but what you think it's doing might not help treat the, the disease in actual patients. So it's not because you are able to modulate a certain protein in the cell that basically you will have the anticipated therapeutic effect. Safety, you would think that when you look at the molecule, you can tell whether it's dangerous or not. Well, that's far from being trivial. So anything we can do to help streamline that process, either uh, <clears throat> starting only the right projects or starting more projects and failing as early as possible, there's a quite a few strategies, should help us uh, to uh, improve that uh, uh, process. And this is a very, very big demand from uh, pharmaceutical companies. How can you, at every stage of the development pipeline, improve um, the quality of our decision making? Now, there are many phases, and for every one of these phases, you can devise uh, interesting machine learning tasks. So we focus on uh, the, one of the earliest steps, which is the uh, um, compound or hit compound uh, identification. So, of course, I know you're not biologists, so let's just try to simplify things a, a little bit. Okay? So you've studied a disease, and you've discovered that some protein plays an important role in that disease. Let's say you're looking for abnormal heart rhythm, and you have understood that how the heart muscle beats is because there are some proteins at the surface of the muscle cells that detect some signals. That's what we call a target. It's a protein, it's something that lives in a cell, and it has a complex shape, and this shape determines what it does. Okay. So you have to imagine kind of a big animal with a complex shape, and basically you can try to interfere with how this thing works, to have it do what you want, or to prevent something from happening. Okay. So for example, taking the example of this uh, uh, abnormal heart rhythm, well this uh, protein that maybe sits at the cell, that it can detect maybe some natural molecule, you know, some signal that comes from your, your body, and what you would want to do is to actually find a drug that will, for example, replace that signal, either block it or actually trigger it at the, at the moment you want. Okay. We see that for many, many diseases. So, for example, insulin resistance, you will try to force production of more insulin to actually help people uh, avoid uh, uh, or the consequences of type 2 uh, diabetes. Okay. So, 
What we want to do is to actually have some protein of interest and then try to find some chemical compound that actually fits in there in the appropriate way. Okay. Now, the chemistry of that is really complicated, and so let's just go for a simple analogy. Let's just imagine that we're looking for a key that fits in the lock, and different chemical compounds are different keys, and then, yeah, when you have a certain lock, well, most of the keys don't work, but maybe some keys uh, might uh, uh, work. Okay. So the main classes of approaches that we will not uh, uh, go into is actually the modeling of this because you have a protein that has a certain shape in 3D. Of course, it's microscopic and eh? it's uh, atomic scale. And then you have chemical compounds. They also have a certain shape. And then you could actually try to see what fits what. Well, challenge is that this lock and key uh, analogy has its limitations because, in fact, the protein is not perfectly rigid and the compound is not perfectly rigid. So basically, when you say something fits in there uh, or changes the shape of your protein or a myriad of other possibilities, you really have to understand the physics of this. This is very hard. And even today, computer simulations to actually know what the shape of a protein is and how a chemical compound can fit in there, this is still today very challenging. Not saying that it's impossible, but it's actually not something that we do that routinely. It's always a serious research project. So there is a lot of methods that are based on this 3D modeling, but this is not what we're going to look at today. Today we're going to look at screening-based methods. So these methods actually look at uh, um, the, your protein of interest, let's say, and try to measure what a compound does to it. Does it interfere with it? So, the biology of that is a bit complicated, but you have to imagine that this protein is supposed to do something, and when it's, for example, not working, you can detect that somewhere there is an effect that does not appear. And for example, you can engineer cells to emit light when the protein is working normally and not emit light when it's not working normally. This is called uh, an assay, uh, um, a drug testing assay. So now you can add actually chemicals to the cells and see whether uh, they, uh, with the, in the assay, and see whether the activity uh, is perturbed by your compound. So one key measure, and the details are not so important here, one key measure is called the IC50 measurement. So basically what you will see is that when there is no compound, you have a certain level of activity. And when you add compounds, well, many compounds will have no effect at all. But some compounds will actually start, as you increase the dose of the compound, to decrease the activity of uh, the protein or in the assay more specifically. So you actually can make measurements at different, these are log scale concentration of the molecule, and this is the activity in your assay. And you see that it starts at some baseline and then decreases, and actually, it doesn't decrease to zero, it decreases to some threshold value. And a key uh, quantity is called the IC50. It's the uh, uh, um, value of the concentration of the molecule that's necessary to actually go halfway in the repression or in the inhibition of the activity of the compound. Okay, so reducing the activity by half, at what concentration does that happen? Well, for an interesting molecule, you should be able to add only a little of it. Okay? At low concentration, I'm able to inhibit uh, the activity. Uh, for a molecule that does nothing, you can add and add and add more of it. Nothing happens. Okay? So a, uh, a good uh, 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 candidate drug has a uh, uh, small IC50 concentration. We usually work on the log scale, minus uh, log 10 uh, IC50. This is one thing, for example, in some other assays, you will measure actually how your compound is activating. So you can flip this curve around and measure the uh, um, uh, EC50 uh, concentration. If you want to kill cells, you're developing an anti-cancer anti drug, for example, you can measure something like lethal dose 50, LD50, the concentration of the molecule that kills half of the cell. There's a number of different measures. 
that uh, uh, you can uh, look at. So we'll simplify this. We assume that we have some method that we can test different chemical compounds and then look at how active they are, a number, okay, on a log scale. And this is what we do with a high throughput screening. So in high throughput screening, a pharmaceutical company will start up a project and say, oh, I'm interested in this disease. I'm going to look for an interesting target. I build an interesting assay. And once I have this assay, I'm going to test to give a, a typical value, half a million different compounds and see uh, whether they are active or not. Okay? You can stop there. Okay? You maybe stop, uh, if you can afford to do half a million, you might have like 1% or 0.1% of the compounds that are active. Okay? Um, I'll show some numbers at the end of the presentation. Um, so the, the fraction of molecules that are potentially active is actually quite uh, uh, small. Okay. Uh, and so you can do that for one project and then for another project and then for another project. Okay. So to give an example, uh, millions of compounds that have been studied over the years and you might have thousands of assays, thousands of targets that have been uh, investigated. Yet, of course, they would very much like to test everything about, uh, against everything. That's not possible because these measurements are not so cheap. So basically what we have are uh, that maybe 1% of those combinations have been uh, uh, tested. We're talking about a fortune to, do this kind of a, to generate this kind of data. Um, but filling the whole matrix, that is not really possible. So going back to the key and, and lock, uh, 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 analogy, well, here you have a heap of keys, you have a heap of locks, and you're trying to find which lock, uh, which key match on which locks. Okay. Now, here, if you only had this, this data, one first question would be, can we predict the rest of the matrix? Okay. And we actually will tackle this problem, but that's not the most classical way in which this problem is looked at. Well, we want to predict which compound is active against which target, Usually we go one step further and we talk about what do we know about the compound. Okay. So compounds, uh, I gave an example uh, 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 earlier. This is another example. These are these molecules. They have a complex shape. They're a complex object. So there is a question here about their representation. They are not you know, a simple string of numbers. They are these 2D graphs. That's how we like to represent them. In fact, they're not even 2D graphs. Uh, a molecule is a 3D electronic structure, and that's what is rep uh, uh, responsible for its uh, physical or chemical uh, properties. Okay? But usually we simplify it down to what we call the chemical structure. And what do we do? Well, we try to represent this not so simple graph. I mean, this one is reasonably straightforward. There are molecules that are big monsters, um, and uh, uh, they are very, very complex. Uh, still, we can try to represent them. Uh, so the easiest trick is to actually make a list of important chemical features. For example, you know, a, a ring like this here. Sorry. Over. Oh, yeah, it's better now. So, for example, a ring like this, you could make a list and say, when you see a ring like this, well, tell me, okay? Uh, <clears throat> when you see uh, this, oxygen, tell me. This would be a feature. And so we can make a list manually of features and then go to a, a, a molecule and say which ones are present or not. Okay? So a few thousand here from 1,000 to 6,000 features. Uh, represent the structure. This is actually quite good. It doesn't capture fully the complexity of the molecule, but it does capture quite a bit of it. Uh, more modern methods, actually what they do is they make an even more complex description. Basically, they do things like I go and stand on an atom and I say, well, here I have an atom of nitrogen, and then they start making small paths. So I have a nitrogen next to a nitrogen. I have a nitrogen next to a nitrogen next to a nitrogen. I have a nitrogen next to a nitrogen next to a nitrogen next to a carbon. You make a list of substrings, subpaths in your molecule, 
Now, this is a large, large, large number of features. We look a lot often at, at ECFP6, which has like 6 million features. Most of them are, are not present in any given molecule, so it's extremely high dimensional, but extremely sparse data. Anyway, what we can say now is that, yes, when you have a chemical molecule, you can represent it by a large binary vector that is very sparse. So the most classical method is just to build a classification or a regression method. It's well established, been developed for uh, the past 50. Structure activity uh, relationships. Uh, basically what it says is, well, on the one side I have as input, and now we're switching to the language. At the input I have a binary vector of features that represents the chemical structure of my molecule. And then, at that, I'd like to build a model to predict values for new compounds. Okay. In a situation where I've actually screened uh, a lot of molecules, even, but I only had a limited number of active ones, so sufficiently high value of this uh, a score. I'm feeling a little bit nervous about moving forward because if I have just a few such molecules or a few families of such molecules, if then this fails, then, then my project stops. So maybe I would like to have more candidates. And then I would build a model like this and use that model to actually predict which other molecules, which I have not tested, are likely to be uh, active. This actually works quite well if we have enough uh, training examples talking hundreds of thousands. When we have fewer, which is also the case for projects, for example, where the measurements are even more expensive, then it gets more uh, tricky. And one key observation is that this actually is one project at a time. So I do this project, I build a model. I do the next project, I build another model. I do the next project, I build another model. Well, actually I've done all this project and all this data is available. Okay. And so <clears throat> a key question we had was, well, could we do better if we actually uh, shared information across tasks? So this is quite classical in machine learning. It's called multitask learning. Could we actually do better if we actually did the predictions with all the tasks together? Again, you have to remember, and that is maybe a different from most machine learning uh, settings, that typically this matrix is not full, okay? So any uh, 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 one compound, or uh, uh, target um, assay, sorry, might have, you know, a few thousand to a few hundred thousand uh, measurements. Any compound might have just a few assays against which it's been uh, tested or more. There are some compounds that are tested all the time and others are only tested uh, uh, rarely. So could we, with some form of, of multitask learning, better uh, tackle this problem and show improved uh, performance? And uh, we're going to look at several approaches. So we've already talked about classical single task uh, QSAR. And now we're going to move to a first family of methods called matrix factorization. Um, this will, will put the compound structure on the side for a moment and then come back to it with a, actually something that merges the two types of approaches, matrix factorization and uh, regression or classification type uh, approaches, um, it's with a method that we have developed and that we call Macau. All right. So before we uh, go to the full method, let's take the which is actually almost identical to the task that we have. So if you the following challenge, it said it has users, and users watch movies, and sometimes they rate the movies. So you have users, you have movies, and you have movie ratings. And this is a data set that is actually available and quite uh, uh, widely used. And it actually shares a lot of characteristics uh, with the type of data we're looking at. Here there was just under half a million uh, uh, users, 
there were 20,000 movies, uh, and uh, the fill rate was about 1%. So actually, okay, this, the shape of the matrix is di a little different, but we are talking about the same uh, uh, data size. And <clears throat> the challenge of Netflix was, if I give you the movie ratings of many users across many movies, can you predict the ratings for um, movies that the users have not seen? It's a recommender system. Uh, it's a very classical uh, s setting. Now, if we look at this from a classical machine learning, uh, this problem is actually a bit unusual because there's no input here for the moment. Basically, you have just the data of a user uh, for many users and would like to make prediction. And so if you stick to the classical classification setting, well, there's no input here and you kind of lost. Yet, this can work. Why can it work? Well, this is actually here very easy because you can na naturally think about this problem. So if I find two users that tend to agree often on, on the movies that they have both seen. So I've seen certain movies, you've seen certain movies, we have like half of them that overlaps, and in those that overlaps, we have a reasonably good correlation, let's say 0 0.7, all right? Then probably the movie that I didn't see, but you saw and you like, there is a reasonable chance that I will like them. Uh, and those that I don't like, same thing. So we can use that information to, let's say, take a bunch of similar users. It's a bit challenging because users do not perfectly overlap. They have not a common set of movies that everybody has had to, to watch. You know, Netflix could not force users to sit and watch 100 fixed movies and then rate each of them. Okay, so you have this incomplete overlap, but the idea of, okay, if I find a bunch of users that are like me and I see what they tend to like, well, that's a reasonable recommendation. It also works for the movies, okay? So if uh, you take, I always take the uh, uh, example of Jean-Claude Van Damme because he's from, from home. Uh, if you take these as action movies, well, people tend e to either like the Jean-Claude Van, Van Damme movies or not like them, okay? And so if you take a movie, you will actually find movies that are strongly correlated uh, with each other so that there is exchange of information, correlations, dependencies between the movies, the columns, and as well between the rows, okay? So basically this is what we're gonna try to capture going to try to build a model that is able to look and when our rows similar, when our columns similar, and try to merge that information, taking into account that only 1% of this is filled. Right? So it's not, a, it's not like an incomplete matrix with missing data where 1% is missing. No, it's the other way around. 1% is observed, 99% is missing. What could we do here? Well, let's first take a step back and imagine that we have the whole matrix, okay? So here we have a full matrix, fully observed, and we'd like to explain what we see in this matrix in a fairly simple way. You can view this as also a form of compression. Let's imagine I have this matrix and I would like to represent it with limited information. One way, certainly not the only way to do this, is actually to do a low rank approximation of this matrix so express the matrix on the left as the product of two thin matrices. Okay. So in real life, of course, the matrices are much bigger. And the idea is that differently from, in th from this case, the uh, number of degrees of freedom in uh, U and V together is lower than in Y uh, by itself. Okay. And actually, this is a very classical method from statistics. It's called factor analysis. And this has been really, really well studied. And we know that it works. So basically, what it does is that it considers that a row of the matrix Y, so a certain Netflix user, can be explained as a weighted combination, as loadings, over latent representations or latent factors of users. So you have to imagine that there are some canonical users people who like action movies, people who like romantic comedies, and now we're gonna try to explain every single user as a weighted combination of these prototypical uh, users. That's what latent factor analysis uh, uh, does. Okay. Yeah, that's here. So how could we solve this problem now? 
Well, <clears throat> basically, we have the matrix Y. That's the only thing we have. But let's take a moment and imagine that of those two matrices, let's imagine that we would know V. I know we don't know V, but let's imagine we would know uh, 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 V. Then, actually, if I give you a rule of Y, I'm asking you to find weights U's that actually best explain that row as a weighted combination of the rows of V. That's actually a linear regression problem. So I can solve this problem. If I have V and I have a, a row of Y, I can find the row of U by solving a linear regression. I can do this for every single row of, um, uh, 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 of Y. So if I give you the whole matrix Y and the whole matrix V, then you can estimate the matrix U. Now, the problem is that, yes, this is very nice if I know V, but I don't know V. But now you can see me coming. <clears throat> this is a method that is called alternating least squares. So similarly, if I knew the matrix U, I could transpose the whole thing and actually solve for V by uh, doing uh, um, uh, ordinary least squares uh, fitting. Okay? And uh, uh, now, because I don't have nor U nor V, what can I do? I can actually alternate between the two. So I can start from some U0, uh, uh, estimate some uh, uh, V1. Once I have V1, I can estimate U1. When I have U1, I can estimate V2, U2, V3, U3. Com uh, do this till I converge. Now, obviously, will I converge to the exact solution? That's maybe uh, not so completely trivial. But we can actually arrange this a little bit, add momentum in here and there, like we do also in gradient search methods, and we can actually find a reasonable solution. So this is a very classical method, alternating least squares for factor analysis. It's basic statistics. Now here, our setting is different. Our setting is, yes, we have a matrix Y, but it's very scarce, as we say. It's very sparsely observed. So there is an issue here about sparsity and scarcity. So a sparse matrix is a matrix that have many, uh, some entries available and all the rest is assumed to be zeros. Okay? Here it's a bit different. We have observed a small fraction of the matrix. Maybe the rest of matrix is absolutely not zero. So what is sparse is it's a sparsely observed matrix and we usually call it a scarce matrix to make the difference between a scarce matrix, which may be full Underlie the matrix underlying it might be full versus a scarce matrix where we believe we have observed everything and most of it is zero. So what do we do? Well, we can actually do the same thing. Uh, simply, what we do is when we measure how good a certain pair U and V is, we actually only look at how good it is at, pr at predicting the available entries. Okay, so we just compare. Uh, y versus u times v, uh, and then we simply add a mask w that tells us only and now we want to solve this problem by minimizing over u and v to find the appropriate solution. And that actually works. You can actually do this. I will um, make some caveats in a moment. But um, Assuming for a moment that now we found a reasonable pair UV that actually approximates the available entries Y uh, in Y uh, well, then now we can compute simply the product of U and V, and that gives us a prediction for the rest of the matrix Y. Okay? So this is the basic matrix uh, factorization problem with incomplete or uh, sparsely observed or scarce uh, data. Now, a criticism of this could be, yeah, you do this optimization and you find the U and V that m minimizes this error, okay? Assuming that you arrange not to get stuck in a too horrible uh, local uh, uh, minimum. Uh, still, a key question is, yes, this optimal value is, or this optimal pair is optimal for the set of available observations. Okay, there's no guarantee that this is, in fact, the optimal pair for the whole matrix Y. And there is not much you can do because you have not observed the other 99%. But this discrepancy between the pair UV 
that optimizes the reconstruction of 1% of the data and the pair UV that optimizes the reconstruction of the whole matrix, that discrepancy might be quite big. Okay. So a key thing is that, well, maybe we'd like to not uh, um, to go too far into picking the exact, the optimal UNV, but we want to accept that there will be a lot of uncertainty on UNV. So what we do is actually we switch to Bayesian modeling. And I will, uh, you know, maybe some of you are familiar with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, maybe some not, so I will not assume that people are familiar with it. I don't have the time to uh, uh, introduce Markov chain Monte Carlo, but I'll just use basic concepts of, of probabilities, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to ask about not an optimal pair UV, but about the probability distribution of U and V given the available data. So the available observation, this 1% in our case, tells us something about U and V, but with no certainty. So a, a correct way to consider the problem is to say that, yes, Y gives us information that will specify some probability distribution on pairs U and V. There are some issues regarding uniqueness there, I don't want to go uh, 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 in there. Uh, we can simply talk, for example, in terms of the posterior distribution, uh, so a posterior predictive distribution, sorry, which is the product of U and V. That solves a number of issues in terms of uniqueness of the uh, solution. Uh, and that would be actually quite interesting, but it would tell you here is a solution and here is how certain you are on the solution. So potentially, if we can do this kind of modeling, we will not only be able to predict an entry in the matrix uh, uh, Y, like we do here, we'd like to, we actually will predict a whole distribution over any entry or even over the whole matrix uh, 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 Y. And that, for example, our, our pharmaceutical partners were very interested in that because they said, well, you're telling us what are possible hits, you know, in the classification setting, but we'd like to know What's the probability that something is a hit, for example, as a certain threshold of activity? So they actually quite like the idea of modeling fully the uncertainty. Now, if you say, okay, let's do Markov chain Monte Carlo, and then you add, okay, I have, let's say, 3 million compounds, I have 1,500 assays, so the matrix of activities is 3 million by 1,500, and for these 3 million compounds, I have 6 million features, um, and I would like to build the Markov chain Monte Carlo model for this. People will look at you and say, well, you cannot do Markov chain Monte Carlo in such high dimensions. And actually, yes, you can. The thing is that you can use a number of tricks that I will briefly uh, detail here to actually overcome uh, the limitations of the high dimension. The key is that you don't have all that much data. The matrix is only 1% filled for the activities uh, for the uh, feature matrix, I think it's 0.01% filled or something like that. So, but extremely sparse or scarce. So, we've tackled the problem with uh, ordinary least squares before, and we're going to start from, from there. So, in alternating least square, we said, okay, you can find a U if you have V and Y. And that formulation is well established, and you can, of course, have all kinds of variants, and you can do partial least squares and rich regression, whatever, doesn't matter too much. But the canonical solution for ordinary least squares is that if I give you <clears throat> the matrix uh, uh, X, that would be, uh, uh, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, U's, uh, and I give you matrix Y, then you can find the regressors uh, beta by actually looking at the pseudo-inverse of uh, uh, the matrix um, you're looking at, okay? So X transpose X inverse, X transpose, that's a pseudo-inverse of the uh, matrix uh, X, okay? So that's a classical ordinary least squares uh, uh, problem. Uh, and in fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna transpose this, this problem in, in a probabilistic setting, okay? So basically, if we say that Okay, we have a, 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 a Y. It's actually X times beta plus some noise. 
Okay, we can look at the behavior of this, and it's actually a, uh, a normal distribution. Okay, and this normal distribution has actually, uh, as a maximum likelihood solution, a, uh, uh, the values you see there for beta. Okay, so that's first the classical ordinary least squares. That's what you do if you want to solve the optimization problem. Now we're going to uh, jump to the probabilistic formulation. And so we use something called the Gibbs sampler, and I will not uh, 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 detail how the Gibbs sampler exactly works, you know, the theory behind it, and why it's a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. I'm going to simply formulate it in the uh, following way. So a Gibbs sampler, it would be here, what we call a block Gibbs sampler, because we update many variables together, would be a scheme where we have two matrices U and V, Okay. And we update u by drawing from the probability of u given the cor uh, current value of v and the available matrix y. Okay. And then we update v by actually taking the probability distribution of v given the current value of u and the uh, available matrix y. And so you see this is very much like alternating least squares. So in alternating least squares we did, if you have a current um, uh, v compute a new value for u. When you have a new value for u, compute a new value for v, repeat that until convergence. Here we say, no, we're not converging. We're actually sampling. We're saying, given u, pick a u according to its distribution. And given a, a, a u, pick a v according to its distribution. And what the theory of, of Markov chain Monte Carlo and the Gibbs sampler says is that if you keep repeating this, then after some time, that's one of the tricks or the difficulties with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo is that you're not very sure how long you have to do this for, but we see in practice that it works uh, reasonably well. The successive pairs of U's and V that you're going to get from drawing U according to its probability given V and drawing V according to its probability given U are actually uh, samples from the probability of the pair U and V given Y. So what you have to imagine now is that you uh, will actually uh, produce pairs of U and Vs. And these pairs of U and Vs represent the posterior distribution of the probability of U and V given Y. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot get an, an, uh, an analytical, uh, analytical expression for the uh, this posterior distribution, so we have to be happy with just getting a sample from that uh, posterior distribution that's at the core of Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo. But you can solve interesting tasks with that. So we can use that to make a prediction, average those uh, 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 values. We can compute variances also, so we can actually pay, take pairs of U and Vs, compute the resulting Y, the predictive uh, distribution, and then actually take the average and the variance in every cell of the predicting matrix. And that will give us predictions that are not only a point prediction, but actually distributional predictions. So how we will do this? Well, we have to compute this probability distribution of u given v and v given u. So we start from the same model, so a linear regression model. Y is XB plus uh, epsilon. And we're going to say that now we're going to look at a uh, posterior distribution of beta given uh, 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 y and uh, uh, x. Okay? This is a classical problem that's called Bayesian linear regression. Uh, details do not matter too much. So you basically say, OK, I'm going to look for not just the optimal value of beta, but its whole distribution. So when you do the math for this, you obtain the following. So you obtain that under mild and reasonable assumptions about the prior distributions and uh, other things like this. You get that the uh, distribution of beta is a multivariate normal distribution with mean and with <coughs> precision matrix, so the inverse of the covariance matrix. Okay. So that's the parameters of a multivariate normal distribution. Now, if you go back a little bit, this is the estimator in ordinary least squares 
the pseudo inverse times y, x transpose x inverse x transpose. What do we have here? This mu n, it's almost the same. You know, there is just a little difference. There is some lambda 0 and lambda 0 mu 0. But if those were to be 0, that would be the same. So actually, the average of your posterior uh, distribution is actually a regularized. So you can view this as regularizers, uh, a regularized uh, value for the uh, solution of the ordinary least squares problem is actually the ridge regression solution. Um, and on top of that, you also have a model for the uncertainty. So you know an optimal regularized beta, which would be here, but you also sure you are about this beta. Okay. So now we know that if I get is this multivariate uh, normal kind of posterior distribution. Now, still, you would have to say, okay, that means that now I have to draw repeatedly from these high-dimensional multivariate normal distribution. Okay? That might not be a piece But actually, it's not very difficult. Uh, there's a, a, a simple trick to do that. We call that the, the gambler trick because uh, <clears throat> uh, it's multivariate Bayesian linear regression, so it gives... Uh, the Gibbs sampler for multivariate Bayesian linear regression, that's the name Gambler comes from. It's actually quite a standard idea. We just didn't see in the literature, so it in the literature, although I, I'm supposed people are familiar with it, and so we gave it that name, the Gambler trick. So basically, when you have to sample from a uh, uh, multivariate normal distribution, what do you do? So you have the covariance matrix sigma. What you do is you find a square root so a matrix such that A is equal to vector of unit uh, normal uh, random noise. Then if you take sample from that unit random noise, multiply it by A, add the mean, actually Z is a uh, sample from this multivariate distribution. That's textbook algebra or probability theory. Now, it is actually possible to a sample from this posterior distribution, but actually, okay, you have to look at this and you actually have to do some, some algebra, but eventually you can show that it is possible to take your x and y, extend that with the regularizer, and then add the noise, and then actually this thing has a distribution you want. What does that mean? It means that if you have uh, a, uh, uh, a, uh, um, uh, you, you want to sample from this distribution, what can you do? You can take your data, add some, some noise with this uh, 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 variance, or standard deviation, uh, adapt a little bit your data matrices, and solve an ordinary squares problem. So sampling from a multivariate normal distribution can be done by solving an ordinary least squares problem with adding noise to the problem. And the math of that, you need to write it down, and it's not, not completely uh, obvious, but at the same time, it's not very complicated. What does that mean? That, mean that, that means that what we can do is to actually solve a Markov chain Monte Carlo Gibbs sampling uh, 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 chain for this uh, uh, problem of estimating the u, uh, the, or inferring the distribution of u and v, we can actually do that by repeatedly solving ordinary squares problem. That's one of the best known problem in numerical analysis. So something that looks extremely fancy doing Markov chain Monte Carlo is now turned into repeatedly solving linear regression with a bit of magic noise uh, uh, in there. That means that it gives us fast algorithms to do that, scalable code, you can do that in, in, in parallel. It's, most of it is actually even tri uh, trivially uh, parallel. So that means that you can run that on really big data sets. Okay. All right. So this is the method we proposed, and now we're going to actually look at, you know, how does that perform compared to uh, other uh, uh, versions. So if you look at matrix factorization, um, 
We're going to look at our matrix, for example, the Netflix data or uh, the uh, drug activity uh, uh, data. And there, there's actually two uh, uh, popular variants, one called probabilistic matrix factorization, which is essentially the alternating least square type of uh, uh, approach that we describe. It's called probabilistic because it's based on maximum likelihood, but in the end, it's actually essentially the, the I think that's very close to the factor analysis that I described. And then Bayesian probabilistic matrix factorization, which is the type of method that I uh, uh, described. Uh, uh, Netflix uh, 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 challenge, what you actually see is that basically, I'll just compare two, you have the um, <clears throat> probabilistic matrix factorization, so it's this number of iterations cannot really compare that with the Bayesian method uh, in terms of number of iterations, but basically you see that the best score you can achieve with this PMF is, is here, while with the Bayesian method you can achieve a lower score. Okay, so the Bayesian version, because it handles uncertainty better, is able to better uh, model your data. And maybe even more interestingly, it does uh, uh, this where it actually matters. So this are uh, um, two curves, so you have PMF and then this is logistic PMF, it's basically adding uh, a logistic function to formulate it as a, um, a classification problem, so it's a slight improvement over PMF, okay, uh, and here is the number of available ratings for a movie, and what you see is that when you have lots of movie ratings, yeah, the two methods do not differ, but when you have only a few ratings available for a user, uh, then it actually makes a big difference. There are applications where even or, uh, and so interested in printing better those assets available measurements is low. For those where we already have half a million, yeah, well, probably we have everything we need, even if we look at it a uh, single task. Let me skip that. Uh, so for those of you who would be familiar with uh, uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo uh, modeling, we can represent this as a, what's called a plate model. Um, and so what this says, basically, is that any entry in the matrix Y so y n m results from the product of some ve vector u with some vector v, so u n times v m. And these uh, vectors, so u, is actually drawn from a multivariate normal with some um, multidimensional mean mu u and some precision matrix lambda u. And those things are themselves are uh, uh, have meta parameters uh, mu zero and here k zero, uh, kappa zero, w zero. Okay. So this is a representation that tells us what the model does. It does that, it, it predicts y by taking a product of vector u and a vector v, and these vector u and v comes from multivariate normal distribution under certain precision. Okay, so what we, uh, for the Gibbs sampler, what we're going to do is we're gonna actually do this update by solving this noisy linear regression at every step. Okay, and in the beginning, it's a bit like similar to the idea of convergence uh, for an optimization algorithm. In an optimization algorithm, well, you iterate until convergence. Well, the Markov chain Monte Carlo method also have a notion of convergence, except that it con does not converge to a fixed solution. It converges to a probability distribution. So basically, the first values that you have from this chain are actually uh, uh, not meaningful, it's only after enough steps that the values are actually approximately drawn from the posterior uh, distribution. But what we see is that you don't need to do a gazillion uh, uh, a number of iterations. That's one of the big issues with Markov chain Monte Carlo. Sometimes you have chains that are well behaved and then you do a two. Rest is usable. Sometimes it takes forever before the samples uh, behave uh, well. So, uh, <clears throat> here, going back to this, a comparison, 
So here we take a public data set, I'll talk about industrial data sets later, a public data set, 15,000 compounds, 300, 50,000 values. So in fact, there is like two orders of magnitude different between the industrial data and the public uh, 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 data. Um, <clears throat> we formulated this as a classification uh, problem and we did proper uh, cross-validation. I'll, I'll mention that a bit later. And here we have one parameter, which is the number of latent dimensions. So when I have U and V, it has a certain thickness. If you make it more thick, well, there's probably uh, potentially more that you can capture, uh, but it might be less robust. When you make it less uh, uh, thick, it will maybe capture less information, but it might be more uh, uh, robust. And so here is the uh, um, misclassification uh, uh, error as a function of the number of latent dimension. And what you see is that after about 10, uh, actually the error uh, plateaus. Okay. And you see that the uh, Bayesian version, uh, um, sorry, the Bayesian version outperforms the optimization version. So we actually hear the Bayesian setting. However, if you compare this to the more classical method, um, a, a classification or a regression, uh, uh, so this is here, where you would say, wait, you've talked about predicting this matrix based on the activity of the compounds against the targets, but these compounds, we know their chemical structure, and we know it's the chemical structure that determines whether or not they're active. So let's just do a classification or regression type of problem, uh, and this is what we do here. So uh, using a regre regression uh, method, we actually see that the input features, you do better. So let me go back to my presentation. So here is what we did, but, sorry. If you do this, you actually do better. Why? Information that you'd been neglecting, you're using it now. Now, that doesn't mean that what we did was useless. It's two different things. So one, look at the structure. Can we predict The other one is only these and try to actually communicate information around, across the different uh, assays to see whether you can improve predictions. And now, obviously, what we want to do is we want to combine both. We get the best of both worlds, and this is where we're going. So this is the uh, representation of the model the Netflix-like model. So basically, we have compounds, we have the targets, so the protein targets, and we want to predict this matrix uh, here. This is the corresponding plate uh, representation. What we simply uh, uh, proposed was to extend this by taking the compound features into account. So when we have a latent representation of a compound, we want to inform that with the matrix of fingerprints for, or the, the fingerprint of that compound to a set of regressors beta. Okay. So basically, we want to factorize uh, Y as a product of U and V, but we want the U to also depend on the compound structure to a set of regressors beta. So that would be the uh, uh, a plate representation we keep the model as before. Y is given by the product of vector u. But now this vector u is also informed by a, a set of a, a i through multiplied by a set of regressors beta. So not a super complicated uh, uh, model. And the good thing is that with that, you can improve the performance further. So you can show that, indeed, in this uh, public uh, uh, data set, as you increase the latent dimension, at some point, this method we call Macau, okay, because it's a gambler, uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we see that we can actually capture extra information from the different tasks. So it's a way to do a multitask uh, regression or, or classification. 
I'll go very quickly through, uh, through this one. Uh, basically, now you also have to sample U, sample V, but also sample beta. And so what you can show is that there is a similar trick uh, that can be applied here. You can look at your matrix beta, and you can also sample beta by solving a linear regression with an appropriate uh, noise injection. So what the cycle is now, update U, update V, update beta, either, at each time a linear regression with noise, do that again, again, and again, and then the result is actually samples from the posterior distribution. So when we run this now on actual industrial data, so 2 million compounds, about 1,000 targets, so a bit of selection compared to what I have uh, given uh, uh, before. We did this with a small fingerprint, so 6,000 features. You know, when I gave the uh, description of fingerprints, the simple ones and the more complex ones, it's one of the more simple ones, 6,000 features. On... Uh, 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 a. Okay. And when you use a large now, so now you have 2 million, 1,000. You can solve that uh, with a, a, a week on a 15 node uh, server. Okay. So this means that these methods do scale up uh, quite uh, elegantly. We wanted to uh, actually go uh, further and now check that indeed what I showed in the previous plot uh, was actually also true on the industrial data. So basically here what we did was to focus on single task versus uh, uh, multitask. So for single task we used a super vector machine uh, with a linear kernel. We looked also at the Gaussian kernel but the performance was similar but not uh, 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 scalable. Uh, and uh, uh, for um, the uh, uh, Macau, we were actually a bit further in our research, so there we tried actually deep learning representation. Uh, so think of uh, deep learning uh, uh, and where we had pre-optimized on the public uh, data a bunch of, of parameters. One important, before I go to the result, one important remark is that basically when we do performance estimation, we have to be careful. So there's a very important effect here because we're looking at chemistry, how chemists work. When they, when they develop a, a new molecule, they re usually develop lots of similar molecules. They will change a piece here, change a piece there, change a piece uh, 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 there. So when you have one molecule, you tend to have like 10, 20, 100 very similar protein um, molecule nearby in chemical space, and then suddenly go much further in chemical space. So you have to, to see that as really like small clusters uh, of related uh, compounds that are all pretty far away from uh, 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 each other. And that makes cross-validation tricky because if you put some members of what we call a series in the training set and some other members of the series in the test set, that then doesn't work because basically when you look at the uh, uh, data from those that are in the training set, it tells you what you want to say on the test set. So what we do is cluster, meaning that before we decide whether a compound goes in the test or in the training set, we group all the closely related compounds together and we either put them all together in a training set or all together in the test, test set. And when we do this, and we look at the performance measured as area under the curve, what we see is that this, uh, this, this is for the single task model, this is for the multitask uh, uh, model, and so when you're above the diagonal, it means that multitask works better than uh, uh, and uh, basically the color is that we make those predictions and when the difference between the two models is statistically significant, we color it uh, this way. And so we see that for over half of the assays, multitask works better and for the other half it's a tie and a single task never wins. So here we have a problem where there is clearly relevant information coming from multitask. Another uh, 
uh, uh, important remark is that even re reasonable improvements robust and, and, and real, they are extremely valuable because error expensive. Okay? You need to have four times as much data. Okay? So that's an important observation is that uh, even when you improve your performance with 10% or 20%, that actually translates into um, a uh, quite substantial number of extra data points that you would need, and that would cost millions of dollars. Okay? So even small but reliable improvements are extremely valuable here. Now here we've done Marcucci and Monte Carlo. If there are some people familiar with those methods here, you could say, okay, yeah, well, just do something else, just something more modern, the Gibbs sampler, that's kind of old school. And so we also looked, uh, uh, because uh, some reviewers were insisting on that, we looked at a very popular method called variational base uh, that actually tries to solve this more uh, efficiently by doing an approximation on, on the problem. But <clears throat> we saw something that we call hierarchical blindness. It's actually not able to propagate information properly through, through the model. And so actually in practice, what we saw was that our um, uh, Gibbs sampling method was actually outperforming variational base. Okay? Um, and so that's, that's important. Maybe another method could do better, but it was important to see that a method like variational base were actually had limitations because it's considered uh, state of the art or close to it. All right. Um, now, this is about chemical structures. That's not the only thing you can look at when you look at compounds. You try to see how active they are. And so there's another type of method that um, uh, uh, pharmacists uh, look at very much and they find very interesting. It's what they call high content imaging. So basically here, you're not going to assay or not the um, um, activity is turned off or, or on. Uh, what you do is you treat cells with a molecule and you see how they respond, how they behave. Let's take a, a simple example. They are sick and then they, they die. Uh, well, if you find a miracle compound that prevents them from dying and you take a picture, you see uh, molecules are doing better than, uh, 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 than other. And so an imaging does just this kind of thing. It will treat cells of an assay with a compound take pictures, and then extract some feature of interest from this data. Typically only one or, or a couple of, of features. And here we, we proposed a, another approach, which was uh, to actually take and actually represent them broadly, so extract features. So I have some feature representation. We use a tool called the cell profiler that extracts things like the shape and the the density and things like that in the, uh, the picture, uh, <clears throat> about um, 800 uh, uh, features, if I remember correctly. So now we could represent compounds by features of the images taken from treating with these uh, compounds. So here what we did, we took uh, 500,000 compounds. So this is an industrial scale data set. You cannot get your hands on that just like this uh, against uh, uh, um, is for 600 targets, about 10 million activities. Um, and this assay, this is uh, interesting, is, is a particular assay. The biology is not so important, but it's supposed to measure something. Okay? Biologists looking at this data would say, this actually measure. That's what you, you get out. Look at the images. Maybe they contain more information than simply what you typically measure in terms of activity of the glucocorticoid receptor. Maybe there is more in there. Sorry. So what we did is we now have two matrices, one compounds versus features of the image and compounds versus activity against the targets. Models. Not, not much 
uh, 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 and, and so we applied this to two projects. So one in oncology, they have a certain target, a kinase, and basically they tested the number of compounds and about just under 1% of the tested compounds were active. Okay. <clears throat> and this target, the process we're looking at, there's no known uh, receptor. So a, a, this has nothing to do with the receptor. Actually, try to predict the whole, make predictions again, 140 compounds. And we get a 40% hit rate. So coming from a 0.7% hit rate after modeling, we have a 60-fold enrichment. We have 60 times more actives uh, than uh, uh, when you test at random. Another uh, project, uh, central nervous system, trying to target initial screen at the and it rates. So only one out of a thousand molecules was, was active. Okay, and then you need to further sort them out. So this was a project that, yeah, you could say, well, we didn't find very much here. Okay. Uh, again, no known relation to the glucocorticoid receptor. We uh, screen the compounds from the imaging data. <clears throat> then there's some magic. So basically initial selection, then the chemist goes and handpicked uh, things that look sufficiently diverse and look uh, exciting. And eventually, the chemist out of the first ranking selects 140 compounds and gets a 20% hit rate. 250 times more hits than in the screen. So basically, we show that from these images, you can really capture information that's relevant to activity. But that's maybe not even what, what got the, uh, the, the, the chemist most So. One of the limitations of structure-based prediction, so you take the structure of your molecule and you try to predict whether it's active, is that you need to have a, number, a bunch of things that are already active, so a bunch of molecules that are already active. And basically, you're going to use that to make a model, but it's basically an interpolation model. So essentially, if I have two molecules that kind of work, well, basically, if I take part of them and bring them together, there's a good chance that it works. So the chemistry that you find with QSAR-like model, even the multitask-like, tends to be chemistry similar to things that you have already seen. And that's one of the limitations in these methods that make the chemists say, yes, you can bring me new hits, but they look so much like things that I've already seen that you're not telling me all that much. All right, so here what you have is three distributions. This is a, a measure of how similar compounds are to each other. Okay, so the, this curve is how similar are the positive hits uh, in the initial screen, so when you select it at random. And so typically, yes, you have, you know, 0.1%, so maybe a few hundred hits, but they tend to be mostly very similar. To, so there, you, you have a, maybe a few hundred, but still it's not like, it doesn't feel like a few hundred. Okay. Um, this is... Uh, selected compounds, much lower similarity, okay? And here is the hits that were found by what we call the biological expansion. And what you see is that some of them look like the initial hits, but about over half of them are actually quite different. There are other chemistry, okay? This is the oncology project, and the CNS project is even stronger. The hits from the initial screen are quite similar to each other, but the new ones that you find are completely different. And that is actually very interesting, very exciting for the chemist because it says, I can actually give you, by looking at images, I can give you new compounds that are unlike compounds you've looked at before, and they are still active. That's what chemists call scaffold hopping. It means that they actually go from totally different chemistry. And there the business side enters because if you're doing chemistry like a competitor, yeah, then the competitor has patents all over the place. So you're kind of blocked, you can't do anything. So sometimes you say, this molecule is exciting, but my competitor has patented this, this molecule and many thousands of molecules around it. So my chemist cannot get me out of this. But if I find like this here, 
a new molecule with a similar then I can hop somewhere else in chemical space and actually uh, start a new direct development program. That got um, the academics very excited. Uh, <clears throat> so, in fact, we did this now not in the lab, but uh, just uh, in silico for all the assays and the uh, uh, surprising uh, uh, result, I must admit it was surprising for us uh, uh, really, uh, was that for about just over a third of the assays, we could actually get some decent signal. And for about 5% of the assays, we could actually get reasonably strong signal. Okay? Uh, uh, quite useful already. So it means that by looking at a single set of images that were apparently not relevant at all for 5% of uh, 600, so 30 assays, we were able to make a reasonably decent model to predict active compounds. And so now what's happening is that our uh, pharma partners are actually uh, bringing together such set of images to uh, build a bigger library and where we will see whether we can use that to predict even more assays reliably. And also, as I said, investigate chemistry that has not been seen before. All right, so uh, um, this uh, method that I, I, I presented is called Macau. It's actually an open source uh, uh, a package that you can uh, find on, uh, uh, on GitHub. It does this uh, factorization with side information. It does that in a regression setting and a classification setting. It has normal uh, uh, models. It actually also supports tensors. So if your data is not matrices but tensors. Uh, and it has some variants of the uh, uh, Gibbs sampler. We're also looking into uh, uh, doing similar things with uh, uh, deep learning. And so the idea, the central concept, and what I find most valuable in this uh, uh, approach is the idea that from this very incomplete data, okay, so imagine seeing a picture and, and you only see a couple blocks in that picture, still you can try to figure out what's actually hiding behind that because you can imagine some kind of latent uh, uh, a representation of the data. And so the idea that basically this incomplete data can, is, might be sufficient to infer some latent representation of compounds and latent representation of targets or whatever objects, users and movies, if you, uh, if you want, that that actually is a core idea. It's uh, somewhat related to ideas of autoencoders, but not, not quite the same. That you would try to learn this representation that when fed to an appropriate network, they allow you to predict the activity. The problem looks a little strange at the beginning because you actually have to learn the input data uh, and you have to learn the network. Okay, so that sounds strange, but uh, only from the activity data. But because you have pairs, and so you will have this co compound with multiple targets and this target with multiple compounds, this is actually a tractable problem. That's something we're investigating uh, uh, now. I'd like to, to close with a, a new trend, something new that is emerging and I'm really quite excited uh, uh, about. It's actually doing this kind of modeling, but actually in a privacy-preserving way. What does that mean? So one day, guys we're working with from, from Johnson & Johnson, they come and say, well, we really like the models you've been building, and uh, we'd like to be doing this with uh, other pharmaceutical companies, but obviously we cannot share with companies. It's too expensive, too, too valuable, and we cannot share it with you either, and we cannot share it with anybody else. So the question was, can you learn together a model without showing the data to each other, and without showing the data to a third party. Now, I must admit, I shook my head. Well, that, that sounds really, really difficult. And then somebody uh, 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 said, yeah, but, you know, privacy preserving. And then we started brainstorming about this. And actually, it turns out that these kind of things can be done. Now, at first, it does sound like magic. So I want to give a, a, a quick example of how that could possibly work. So imagine that a number of, we have a number of people here. And we want to compute the sum of numbers that you have chosen yourself. So let's pick 10 people. These 10 people, they each pick a number between uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 1 and 10. 
and we want to compute the sum and we don't want anybody telling what their number is nor to each other nor to me again that sounds like magic at first that be done okay so there is some uh, number that you've picked and what are we going to do we're going to each pick another bigger random number let's say something uh, between 0 and 100 there are some boundary effects but that's not very important here and also pick a random number between 0 and 100 like a noise thing okay the idea is that we're going to sync the signal uh, under the uh, the uh, um, in the noise so basically these well, here we pick four. These four people will add their chosen number with the random number. And they will pass me these sums. So S1 plus R1, S2 plus R2, S3 plus R3, S4 plus R4. Okay? I see these sums, but obviously I cannot guess the original because it's kind of hidden in... in okay? To this... Uh, for sums, I also add my own random number. So basically, I have R0 plus S1 plus R1 plus S2 plus R2 plus S3 plus R3 plus S4 plus R4. That I put on the side. And now we organize a chain. So I take my random number. I pass it to the first person that adds now uh, uh, R1. Then to the, passes that to the next person, or adds R2. R3, R4. So here we have computed R0 plus R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. What do we do now? Sorry. We subtract the two, and boom, we have S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. Now the scheme is not perfect. There are some mild attacks against it, but it gives you the, the gist of it. It is possible. Uh, together to compute the sum of these numbers without anybody else but the original owner to know the value. So we actually proposed a, a similar scheme which we're currently uh, uh, developing. So if we do Macau, what you have is you have, uh, uh, you're trying to learn from your data uh, U, V, and beta. Let's say there is a first party doing that. Then there is a second party, and they could do the same thing. They could actually, from their data, learn U2, V2, and beta2. Okay, but obviously, if they connected, there would be no communication whatsoever, and they would not be able to benefit from the information available in each other's data. So the uh, scheme we propose is the following is to say, well, when we have u and v, u is about the compounds and v is about the targets. Actually, the targets are really uh, important because they determine which projects people are working on. And so basically what was uh, built is a, is a scheme where we will jointly build a u that is common for all the partners, but we will each keep our own v. And so when we alternate, we basically alternate uh, uh, all the v steps but we never show the Vs to uh, 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 any other party. Keep this private. Now, if you have U and Beta, but you don't have V, there is no way, at least we think for the moment, to reconstruct Y or even mildly informative uh, 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 information. So here we can propose a scheme that is actually able to learn a model based on everybody's data, but where the model is actually broken into a joint piece that we agree to share, it's a kind of latent representation of compound, and a private piece, which is a latent representation of the assay of a single pharmaceutical company, and that is kept uh, private. And that actually is at the heart of a, a major industrial project. It's an IMI, Innovative Medicines Initiative. So not exactly this method, I need to keep it confidential, but a deep learning variant of this is actually used now uh, in to develop a tool that will be used by 10 of the world's major pharmaceutical uh, companies to do exactly this learning and build predictive models that they can use in-house. So I'd like to, uh, to conclude. We proposed, or I proposed a method for a fully MCMC Bayesian multitask uh, learning through matrix factorization. It's scalable, it's parallelizable, 
uh, it works at, at scale. Uh, and it's particularly attractive when you want to model prediction uncertainty, when your target matrix is scarce, and when your feature matrix is, is sparse. We obtain uh, performance that's state of the art on these uh, industrial chemogenomic. Uh, and to finalize, I want to thank the people in my team who've been developing uh, those uh, uh, methods. Uh, they're maintaining this uh, 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 great Macau uh, code. Uh, also, the people at uh, Johnson & Johnson, Janssen Pharmaceutica in Belgium, who actually came up with lots of great, uh, uh, exciting uh, uh, questions, in including the privacy-preserving machine learning, as I described. And I'm looking for a couple of postdocs and PhDs, so if anybody's interested, you can always talk to me. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? You said uh, on Netflix uh, problem, uh, Bayesian regression uh, has better results rather than SVD and uh, logistic re regression. Why it is? Can you say again? Please. So basically because your data is very incomplete, which means that the, the, the methods that find an optimum, they find an optimum for the available data. But actually, when you test, for example, you do a cross-validation, you're going to take some of the data out. The data that you take out is actually from the behavior of the entire matrix. So the, 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 the optimal value you would want is the optimal value for the full matrix, but you obt obtain an optimal value for the uh, highly incomplete matrix. And these two things are quite different. So taking the uncertainty into account saying how, where am I certain and where, where am I not certain will allow you, for example, to compute a, a posterior mean estimate that is actually better than any single individual uh, uh, estimate. Thanks. Any other Hi, uh, it was such an inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what is the current state of art in privacy preserving machine learning algorithms? Uh, because I'm working on security uh, and the data sets are really unreachable for, uh, I don't know, for even Turkey. So uh, what is the state of art and um, what can, we do in this area for research. Okay, so well, describing the state of the art, maybe not that straightforward, but let's try to, 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 to be short. So everybody wants this wonderful, magical, fully homomorphic uh, encryption uh, methods. That's not there yet, okay? But what we have realized is that with the available tools, essentially what's called somewhat homomorphic encryption for people who are not familiar, Homomorphic encryption would mean that you encrypt your data, you compute of the encrypted data, you decrypt the result, you have the end result. That's not natural because normally you encrypt data, then it's encrypted, and you cannot compute on it. Well, homomorphic encryption says you encrypt the data in a certain way, you do your computations in a certain way, you decrypt the result, and the decrypted result of this map manipulation is actually the solution of the uh, um, uh, um, calculation on the unencrypted data. That's homomorphic encryption. In homomorphic encryption, basically, uh, uh, you have the basic methods and they allow you to do, for example, sums. This is what I did. But to do most calculations, you need sums and products, and a fully homomorphic method would need to allow you to do both sums and multiplications uh, uh, in, uh, in the encrypted domain. That still remains. There are some methods, but they're really kind of harsh to uh, use in, in practice. However, what people have seen is that 
with the simpler method or with what's called multi-party computation. In multi-party computation, what you do is you take your data and you have to imagine that you split the data into pieces. Like imagine that you put all the odd digits on one side and the even digits on the other side. You do the calculation on both sides and then you bring everything back and the parties doing the partial calculation have no idea of the end result. Simplifying again. Well, with somewhat homomorphic plus multi-party computation, you can already do a lot of things. And I think the cryptographers really want to go for the grail of fully homomorphic scalable uh, uh, solutions. But in fact, when you take what's available and you're applying it to existing algorithms, you can do logistic regressions, you can do deep learning, you can do uh, matrix factorization in privacy preserving ways. So, so it is possible to actually tackle machine learning in a privacy preserving way today. Now, a question is, in which, on which question is that the right thing to do? Because here we really have a situation where the parties are paranoid about having someone see their data. There will be many situations where the, the parties will, be, will want their data to be protected, but they will be willing to tolerate some amount of risk. And then I think more classical IT solutions like federated and distributed uh, uh, learning might be largely sufficient. So for example, for medical data, it's not always clear that you need the fully homomorphic or, or, or fully privacy preserving machine learning, that there might be other ways to do that that are fit for purpose. I'll try to, to keep it there because otherwise it's a bit long. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentations. It was very informative. Um, I will ask for privacy preserving some. In your presentation, you illustrate your source data between 0 to 10, but you add um, randomness between 0 to 100. Is yes, that so th there I, I said, well, no, there, there, so there are boundary effects. So if, you, if the sum of the two is 0, for example, you would know that it had to be 0 because, uh, uh, but you can solve that by, you know, this was just illustrative. If I do this by taking a number between minus large and plus large and do that in a modular way, then this can be done correctly. So just, so you do it modulo and then everything checks out. It's a bit more difficult to explain, but it can be solved. 